Let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 12. We're going to be uh, talking today on the subject of the triumphant Jesus. <clears throat> Say it with me, the triumphant Jesus. Triumphant. Say it like you're triumphant also. Triumphant. <laughs> Praise God. By the way, because uh, of uh, some plans that we have in the future, two things. Um, my wife is uh, beginning to look into things that, that will lead towards 2022. That is uh, February, wherein we will plan to, to go back to, uh, to Israel, okay? And then, of course, the moment things open up, we'll, we'll have our missions. So those of you who are coming on missions or planning to go to missions, maybe it's August or November, and planning to go to, to Israel on, on February of 2022, the, the moment you have the opportunity to get vaccinated, uh, get it, okay? Because, uh, for example, especially in missions, I will require that, S simply because uh, the health conditions in the Philippines is different from here. So if, if you plan to go with me on missions, get yourself vaccinated, or uh, I will have to, to uh, not allow you to come, okay? Because I think that is an nasty as far as the Philippines is concerned. And I think in Israel they are requiring that. Uh, travel is beginning to loosen up a little bit, but for example, there are now trips that are coming out of Israel, but they require uh, a vaccination from COVID-19, uh, okay? So we have been uh, seeing in the story that we have been following the escalation of hostility against Jesus. Now, remember, this is Jesus himself standing for the truth. Jesus promised that, that if you uh, want to live right, you will suffer tribulation or trouble, persecution. That goes hand in hand. Why? Because the God of this age is Satan. Okay? It's just like if your family stands for something, you will, you will uh, suffer persecution. For example, if your family stands for the following things, and then you have family members or uh, distant family members who don't stand for those things, you will suffer persecution. It's normal. Uh, the moment right confronts wrong, there will be hostility. Now, the way of the world is trying to go into the, the uh, arena of compromise. The moment you go into the arena of compromise, there's no more right, there's no more wrong. That, has what, that is what happened to the American society. Nobody wants to offend anybody. So what happened? The atheists, I think it's even wrong to say, to say liberals now. I think the anti-Christian and the anti-God section. Because some of these so-called liberals, they actually have, have a knowledge of God. But they have been overtaken by this uh, uh, anti God and Antichrist political wave. And so those who are right in desiring to please the others have compromised. And so their faith is compromised. So Jesus was sent to be the truth. Truth will not be loved by lies. And so if, if you want to stand for what is true and right, those that are in the side of lie and wrong will never like you. And so, live with it if Jesus experienced escalating hostility. I mean, in, in this church, it even happened. If I preach something that doesn't resonate with your carnality, you don't like it. <laughs> well, too bad. This is the way it is. Now, the only question that you have to ask is whether I am teaching the scriptures or not. If what I'm teaching is the scripture... And, and you can see it's in the scriptures, and you feel repulsed by it, then you have to examine your heart. Uh, something like that. That's just the nature of the truth. It always confronts the lie. Now, from the natural perspective, it seems like Jesus', Jesus ministry is coming to an end because now they want to kill him. And from, from the uh, external looks of it, <clears throat> it seems like he's got, getting beat because the way we... The way we look at, uh, we don't really practice discernment, 
Okay? Now, discernment may be a wrong term. We don't really practice discerning of spirits. Okay? Because, because we just look at the external things. Now, if you look at Jesus, the Pharisees who were backslidden say he's a blasphemer, he was demon possessed, he is a Samaritan. Look at their discernment. He was a blasphemer, he was demon possessed, he was a Samaritan. And one other thing, he was a sinner. That's from the external perspective. And by the way, a carnal Christian, a carnal person, doesn't carnal Christian, a carnal person looks at it that way. We, we, we always say, well, this person is dressed nice, he must be nice. You know, they may look at Anne and say, well, Anne has uh, expensive clothes and expensive shoes. She must be a millionaire. No, she's not. Okay. I know. <laughs> she limits my expenses, so she's not. Well, she must be rich. No, she's not. Okay. But from, from the outside, you may, you may see her as a person that may, be, that may have classy and expensive things. And so you may think that she's overflowing with money. She's not. But that's a carnal judgment. But then if, if you know her, then you will know that actually she's a very wise person. Wise in terms of expenditures. Wise in terms of uh, purchasing. Uh, she is a wise person in terms of that. But most people will never see that. Now, you look at her. She is 4'11 and a half. I have to include the and a half because it's almost 5, Okay. And then when, she's, when you see her wear her shoes at six inches heels, then she becomes five, four and a half, okay? So th that's just the, the way it is. Now, if you look at her, you may say, well, she is small. You are looking blindly. She is not small. She has a big heart. She's a giant inside. She dreams bigger than most people. Okay. What's the difference? The difference is discerning what is inside the person and a carnal person will will be blinded by that we just judge from the outside so when we look at jesus it seems like he is losing he's about to die but when you discern him and you look from from divine perspective the way god looks at things he was actually triumphing he's very victorious He's now about to stage the biggest victory that he will ever uh, have. And that is resurrection from the dead. But by the way, before there could be a resurrection, he has to die. Now death from the outside looks like ultimate defeat. That's the ultimate thing. You're dead. So it looks like ultimate defeat. For him to defeat death ultimately, he has to die so that he can raise himself back to life. So two different perspectives. One is natural and carnal. The other one is spiritual. You know, when, when you see a person doing the right thing, you may, you may laugh at that person. And, and you may say, well, that, that, that person is losing it. He doesn't know how to compromise. He doesn't know how to go along. He's going to die or he's going to disappear. No, he's not. All of you who compromise and, and uh, is not willing to stand for what is right, you are dying, actually. You are losing it. But the ones who are always ready to embrace the truth, they are the ones who are actually going up. They are the ones who are actually going to make it and will continue to move from victory to victory. That's why I, I entitled this uh, lesson, Triumphant Jesus. Now, in, uh, in all of this, the Pharisees want to control everything. They want to control the spies. They were sending people in the camp of Jesus. Now they were able to recruit Judas already. They were sending scholars to question Christ, etc., etc. It, like, it seems like they hold the strings of the, of the puppets. But... That's from the natural perspective. From the spiritual perspective, Jesus got them exactly where he wants them to be. He is, he is the one who is in control, you know. And, and, and you, just have, you just have to look at it. 
uh, from that perspective. Otherwise, you will lose uh, the meaning of what the passage is trying to teach us. In John chapter 12, John, uh, we will see once again a triumphant Jesus and his enemies who continues to fall into the, uh, we can say, abyss of eternal defeat. Let's look at the anointing of Jesus for his burial. John 12, starting on verse 1. John 12, <clears throat> starting on verse 1. Say praise the Lord. Are you ready to study? Okay. Six days <clears throat> before the Passover. This will be his last Passover on earth. Well, he is going to be the Passover lamb. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was. The one that Jesus had, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him, for him there. Martha was serving them and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the, with the fragrance of the perfume. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, Judas is one of the twelve, right? Now, now watch, what's now his attitude? They were having dinner. Uh, Mary anointed Jesus with this very expensive nard. Now, I want you to look at this behavior. Judas, who was about to betray him, he was already conniving with the chief priests. He said this, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 naira and given to the poor? Now, what would you think if you are the leader and somebody of your top lieutenants made a comment like that. Now look at this from this comment. It, it sounds wise. How much, is their sal uh, how much is their daily pay? One denarius. So 300 denarii will be almost a year's salary. So to say, why are you wasting this money? It sounds wise. But, but Judas was one of his lieutenants. And he said it at the hearing of everybody. You are opposing your leader now in public. Now this is Judas. Okay? Let me keep reading. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would, and would steal part of what was put in it. He was deflecting, actually. He has been a thief, so he wants to appear like he cares so much about the money. You know what I'm saying? Uh, do you know that most people who, who talk so much about managing the money that they, doesn't belong to them don't know how to manage their own money? Yeah. It's deflection. You know, most people who talk about, uh, you know, giving, giving advice... Hey, this is how you become a good student. Do this, do this. They don't know how to become good students. Yes, it's deflecting. And, and this is what you are saying. He has been stealing money. And so to show that he's got some integrity in terms of money, he was saying, why was that being wasted? Well, you have, you have, you have been spending money that's not yours. You see? But this is what's happening. Jesus answered, that means Jesus heard it. Huh? Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for, for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now remember, Jesus answered. Whom did he answer? Who asked the question? Who, who made the statement? Judas. It was at the hearing of everybody. So was the statement of Judas. But he was answering Judas. <laughs> Look at this. this. He can really discern. This, this is what I'm saying. From the outside, if you are a natural leader, Jesus would have said, I, I really have 
an excellent treasurer. Look at this. He is computing how much was the worth of this expensive perfume. He even knows how much. He knows marketing. 300 denarii. I, I got me an excellent treasure. But Jesus doesn't judge the way we do. He can discern human spirits. And he said this. Leave her alone. Don't, don't, don't think of this as Jesus being nice. Leave her alone. No, he said, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. Why? Because Mary would be embarrassed. You know, you are, you're a wasteful person. You're an extravagant person. Now he was, he was defending Mary. But you, he was looking at Judas now, but you always have the poor with you. But you do not always have me. Now look at the double effect. If it's the crowd, I will be gone soon. But if it's Judas, Judas, I, am, I have not always been in your heart. You pretend like you care. I am not in your heart at all. Uh, read it that way and, and you will begin to see in the crowd a one-on-one -on -one conversation taking place between Jesus and Judas. He, he effectively told Judas, I am no longer in your heart, Judas. I was, it is amazing that Jesus didn't fire him right away. You know. I, I, have, I have told people that. When I feel they are, become, they, are, they are unfaithful to the Lord now, oh boy, they, they, they get upset. Uh, because you should see it. You, you should not see it from the, from the outside. You should be able to discern. And, and Jesus simply said, hey, Judas, I'm no longer in your heart. Can you imagine? You're still one of the twelve. He doesn't have the decency to uh, admit. He's criticizing now a woman who was very close to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is in the heart of Mary. Jesus is no longer in the heart of Judas. Perhaps it is deep gratitude for raising Lazarus back to life. So the family threw a dinner party of Jesus. This happens to also be the first <clears throat> Uh, event in the Passion Week of Jesus in the religious calendar. Of course, this, when is Easter anyways? April 4. April 4. Okay, so uh, if this is March before April 4, this will be the uh, triumphal entry, right? So, but of course, you should know by now, I really don't care about those calendars. Wherever the preaching goes, that's what we preach, you know. Once again, let's look at the different personalities in the family. First of all, let's look at Martha. We looked at her last week. Uh, what, when, what can we say about Martha? He, she is her usual energetic self. What is she doing again? Once again, she is serving. Now, the interesting thing about that serving, the term serving is where we get the word deacon once again. Is the diaconeo, okay? That's where we get the word deacon. So Mary, uh, and I'm sorry, Martha is actually a natural deaconess. Okay? Uh, if if uh, they just chose, they, they, if they just chose a woman in Acts 6, easily she's one of those. Okay, but, but listen, Jesus, remember in one of the occasions she was rebuked. Mary chose uh, the best place. I would suppose that Martha had a correct attitude in the heart now. But she never let go of her attitude of service. Now, nobody calls her deaconess Martha. But the term that was used is deacon. Okay. Again, it's only the church that glorified the position of a deacon. It's not a glorified position. It's a servant position. It's a slave position. Okay? You're supposed to go, uh, one of the definitions is uh, one who wait on tables. So this is, this is what, what it is. Oh, the, the church needs a lot of people like this. Uh, those 
whose heart is just to serve. You know, first, I, I think if we want to be in the will of God, what we really have to major on is service, how to serve. Do not, do not look for titles. Do, do not look for positions of prestige or fame. You know, I told you in one of the elections of deacons before, I was interviewing candidates, of course, because you have to screen them. So I asked this guy, he's no longer here, why, why do you want to be a deacon? Well, so, so that when you're not in the uh, church, uh, I can preach. Well, that's very presumptuous. Number one, he assumed I will assign him to preach. You know, you, you, for you to say, well, I want to be a deacon so that when, when you're gone in your missions, I can preach. Where are you assuming I will assign you? Do not have that attitude. I, I think what, what you have to, to keep in your heart is a servant's heart. Mary's, Martha is like that. She is always serving. And, and Jesus, Jesus did not rebuke her for this, this time. You know, because she recognized, Jesus recognized that uh, Martha is in her rightful place. Some people have that heart. They, they really just like to serve. Now, Anna's been dealing with a lot of contractors. Even, even with a lot of these workers, you know, some, some of these people, they are, un hired somebody that he just keeps volunteering. If, if he sees Ann carrying something, he wants to carry it. You know? Others, how much are you going to pay me for it? You know? Like, like uh, the service is not there. What, what Jesus is looking for is a servant's heart. And that is one. She is very grateful. She expresses her gratitude by serving. Lazarus was reclining at the table. You know, Lazarus surprised me. Because I thought Lazarus should be serving. After all, he was the one raised from the dead. Maybe he just told Martha, I did not eat for four days, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> spoiled brat, yeah. But really, uh, I, I cannot say anything anymore, but he surprised me. Well, perhaps the good position is really to, uh, to sit and recline at a table with Jesus. But come on, you know, you just came back to life. You should express more gratitude. But he was just there enjoying himself eating, you know. I don't know if we need more Lazarus. Maybe we need, we need more people to be raised from the dead. But, but uh, I, I, think, I think the moment Jesus gives you a miracle like this, you should... I was expecting more, perhaps, from him, you know. But uh, this is all we see. After he was raised from the dead, he started eating, you know. But uh, you can tell also by that gesture of, uh, or, or, or position of eating with him, reclining at the table with him, Jesus really loved, loved this guy. The third one is, once again, Mary. Mary is her usual self. What is her usual self? Whenever you find Mary, you find a person who gives extra attention to Jesus. Yeah. Uh, Filipinos have this uh, culture. Okay na yan. Oh, that's, that's the wrong piece. No, okay na yan. Takpan mo na lang. You know. I, I think if Filipinos are, are, uh, are adventurous, we'll be excellent in flipping properties. Yeah. Wala ang drywall. Manila paper na lang. Pinturahan na lang. <laughs> you know. Uh, this is, this is, Mary is different though. He, he gives careful attention to details. She was very grateful. So, so Martha ended up serving tables, cooking. Lazarus ended up sitting and eating. But Mary, how, how in the world am I going to express gratitude to Jesus? I'll buy him a new pair of shoes. She said, sandals, that's cheap. I'll buy him a new robe. Ah, but, you know, he said, he said, Jesus is, is always under the sun. And crowd is always thronging at him. I'll buy him <laughs> perfume. But that is not the reason. What is the reason why Mary bought this expensive perfume? Why? 
She is the only one who understood Jesus. Jesus has been telling people, I am going to die. She said, I, must, I might as well prepare for her burial. This is what she said. So you see what I'm saying here about, about uh, discerning somebody? You know, there was, I told you the story. There, there was, you know, sometimes when, when uh, you help people, you actually don't help them, you curse them. I told you about a pastor that, that I was ministering with years ago, over 20 years ago. The church gave him a, uh, a car, the sports car, Toyota something, the two-door sports edition. No, no, not, not, not Supra. Uh, Celica, yeah, Toyota Celica. And I, ha I happened to be talking to this. They gave it to him. Why? Because the owner has a junk. And so he, instead of throwing it away, it's just like some, some people, you know, they, instead of throwing away their garbage, they want to look generous. They, I mean, some of you may have done that. You need to repent, you know. Uh, you're ready to throw away something. You want to, to look generous, so you gave it to somebody. Well, the Celica happens to be always in, 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 a, in bad shape, always needing repair, almost every week. His allowance per week is not even enough to pay for that. So I, I look at the board when we were meeting. I said, I think, by the way, I said this in front of the board. I said, you think you're blessing him? I asked for his salary increase, and he doesn't even know it. I said, you think you're blessing him? I said, you're not. That's a curse, because the car is actually needing repair every week. I said, nothing is left. I told the board that. Okay, so I have, been always, I have always been like this. Uh, that's why God sent me in front of you, you know, because I've always been like this. But uh, they, they didn't even realize it. You know, when you bless somebody like Jesus, you bless him appropriately. Understand. Understand. Oh, I need that. I need some couch. I have no more money. I'll give you some couch, but repair this first, okay? You buy new leather, you buy new... Well, I might as well buy a new one. When you, when you bless, be sensitive. The way, the way Jesus doesn't need new shoes, he's about to die. Jesus doesn't need new clothes, he's about to die. He's about to be buried, though, and nobody is preparing for it. Nobody is preparing for it. Now, I always say this. I can say this now because, of course, uh, I already have five kids. But uh, I, I say this, for example, when, you, when somebody is about to be married. Now, I don't know if anybody here is about to be married. You will be blessed by this. Uh, when somebody is about to be married, stop planning to give him pots and pans. I mean, what is he going to do with that? They don't even have a house. Give him some cash, okay? Give him some money. Let them buy what they need. If you're going to give a gift to Jesus, in this, in this time that we have right now, what's the best gift for him? Well, of course, as a given, you're born again. What does Jesus want to do the most today? Make disciples. Make disciples, that's eternal treasure, because he is coming back again. That's what he wants. You know, that means you can apply it both ways. One way is us as his disciples. This is a time wherein our faith should be getting more established because Jesus is coming back again. If, if you want to give a gift to Jesus, that's what he wants the most, disciples. So, this also, the giving of this, of this, uh, of this uh, gift uh, is because Mary is the adoring and the worshiping kind. This is not just an act of anointing. This is an act of worship. Because anointing oil, oil in the scriptures are well prepared by a perfumer. And it is designed to prepare the house of God for worship. Okay? So these are... These are all of the things that are into details. And we can see this in these three kinds of personalities. So what kind of personalities are you? you know, are you uh, the serving kind? Again, no negative thing is, is given here. No negative thing, not even for Lazarus. Are you the eating kind? You know? uh, that is after, after Jesus gave you a tremendous miracle, all you want to do is to eat. Or are you the, uh, 
the worshiping kind, the one that is Mary. All of these are expressions of gratitude. Now, let's look at contrasts of character. The contrast that I will make, you know, I'm not going to make the contrast between siblings. Um, they have their own personalities. Let's, let's make contrast of attitude between disciples. And the contrast that I would like to bring to the front is the contrast between Mary and Judas. Okay? Mary and Judas. Mary. What, what does, if you look at Mary, what does she represent? First of all, Mary embodies self-sacrifice. This, I don't know how, how rich they are or how mine they are, but can you imagine, I mean, are you going to give somebody a gift that is worth a year's salary? Huh? I mean, that's a, a very expensive gift. Now, Martha threw in a party. She, she can cook well and she, she serves well. She gave her best. The best thing that Martha always does is to serve. And so she used her ability to serve to give her best to Jesus. But, but Mary, she embodies self-sacrifice. Walang sayang. She expressed her feelings in a very costly gift. You know, very costly gift. Now this is, this is I think, what Jesus is emphasizing. Uh, he, he said, invite somebody who can't invite you back. You're really self-sacrificing if you do that. But if you only, for example, give gifts to people who can give gifts back to you, then that is your reward. If I give DJ a gift because she can give a gift back to me, that's my reward, no other reward. But if I give a poor person a gift because he cannot give me back, then God has to reward me. You see, you have to choose your reward. And, and most people will choose an earthly reward. We really like temporary. We don't, we don't, uh, we, just, somebody just, just tell you you look good. You, that's enough for you. Very short-sighted. You know. no, no plans for the future. She also took the place of a servant, a lowly servant. Remember she was wiping uh, uh, her, his feet with, with, uh, with her hair. And she also possessed spiritual discernment when she anointed the body of Jesus for burial. She was ahead of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, members of the Sanhedrin court. With this also, she, 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 uh, she displayed that she was very sympathetic uh, in mind. She was very intuit intuitively, maybe as a woman, you know, uh, he, she understood Jesus. He, Jesus. Jesus could no longer be with them for a long time. I mean, in a week's time, he's dead. After the resurrection, he's no longer walking with them every day. He just appears and disappears. The relationship will be changed after this week. So she's got six more days, because in six days, the Passover is about to, to take place. Few more days, nobody understood except Mary. So Mary maximized, you know. You know, I, I, I wish uh, we can apply that in a, from the simplest level of our relationship. You know. For example, if you are a parent, spend time with your kids. Soon they, they'll get old. Uh, when, when my kids were, were born, you know, this... Uh, these people who study how to take care of babies, when they themselves have no babies, they say, don't hold the babies because uh, you, will never, you will never be able to put them down. These are wise people. They have no children, you know. So they, they say that. And so my, my, my wife uh, bought a crib. No, no, she doesn't buy a crib. She buys cribs, you know. Uh, one for whatever reason, you know. But she's got a crib in. So my, my, my kids will be crying, and, they'll, and I'll, I'll pick them up. And, and uh, people comment, don't, don't pick them up, because uh, you will always pick them up. And my wife says, sweetheart, we should not pick them up, because we will always pick them up. And I told my wife, I will always pick them up. Why? Because I will not always pick them up. Did you understand that? 
I have to pick them up because I will, all, I will not always pick them up. Can I pick up DJ now? She'll break my back. <laughs> yeah. Can I always pick up James? No. I can't even pick up Joel now. My time to pick them up, hold them very close to my heart, is very limited. That's why I have to pick them up. Forget what uh, Dr. Uh, what's that doctor? I, I heard he doesn't have kids, you know. Uh, and I heard his kids, if he has kids, they rebel against him. But uh, I, I am very conscious that my time with my kids are very limited. Therefore, I have to pick them up. Because I will not always pick them up. You see? But be, most people, maybe you can say this, we get satisfied with so little too soon. You, you get a little blessing and you're very happy. Oh, I have a child. Okay, let them do whatever they want. You get satisfied. I'm not satisfied with that. I want to be able to raise them up in the fear and knowledge of God. I want to see them grow. You know, I want to, I want to see them make decisions. My wife is very concerned when my kids are making wrong decisions and, and she'll say, She'll try to micromanage and say, no, 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 I said, that. the decisions are not about right or wrong or sin or, or, uh, or holiness. I said, for as long as it's not about sin and holiness, let them make a decision. They'll, they'll make mistakes. Of course they will. We still make mistakes. I want to see them make mistakes so that I can pick them up, yeah. so I can help them. But the issue should not be sin. If it's sin, my behavior is very different. Why? Because I will not always be there. You know, I will not always be there. They had no idea that Jesus was serious when he said, I'm about to be sacrificed. And so Mar Mary now just wants to embrace uh, him. Remember on that resurrection morning? He stopped holding me. Tell me, my, my, my brothers. Why? Because he found, she, she found Jesus. Now she's no longer just pouring nards. She, she doesn't want to let him go. Well, you died already. I'm not going to let you go anymore. No, 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 no. I, I, I have to leave. So can you please tell my brother, I'll meet them in, 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 uh, in, in uh, Jerusalem. I'll meet, them there. I'll, I'll meet them in Galilee, I'm sorry. I'll meet them in Galilee. Because I'm about to leave in 40 days. In 40 days, I'm gone. So you should tell them. I have, I have some more things to tell them. I have to review everything that I taught them. You see? But, but Mary is this person who just keeps pressing close. Listen, the reason why we miss God's voice, we don't press closer. We just don't. I know what's it with us. We get born again and that's it. Well, I'm on my way to heaven now. No, that's not Christian. That's not discipleship. Discipleship is, is pressing closer. It's pressing closer. It's like, it's like when people get married. Well, I'm already married. She, she, she already got pregnant twice. Forget her. No, the, the, uh, the older you get, if you are married, the, the closer you should press towards each other. You know? like, like my kids now are getting big. Can you imagine Joseph gets married, John gets married? Do you think they'll pay attention to me? I think the only person at the end, they, they have developed their careers, the only person that will pay attention to me is my wife. So I have to, I have to press closer to my wife. Why? What if we get old and I'm not, I'm not close and loving to her. You said, ah, tanda ka na, amoy lupa ka na, bahala ka sarili mo. I cannot afford that. I don't know how to cook. What will I eat? Ramen noodles all the time? No. I'll die quickly that way. You know? I, I have to press. We, we, have, we have this very short sight. Uh, we are very short-sighted in our view of life. That's why we don't take care of things. Look, the Bible says, Enjoy the wife of your youth. Because your wife will only be young once. Whether you like it or not, they will fill in the blanks, okay? <laughs> because my wife is listening. Okay. What about Judas? Now, Judas, 
um, supposedly, I, I use the term supposedly, supposedly is very close to Jesus. Why? He was made treasurer. You know, when you want somebody to handle your money, that must be a person that's close to you. I mean, you don't just give your money to anybody to handle your money. And the name Judas is a very beautiful name. What does Judas mean? Praise. Yeah, beautiful name. So, Judas was assigned as a treasurer. For over three years, he is ringside. He is front and center watching Jesus. You know, can you imagine? Hey, uh, let's, let's go to the town, find an inn, we will stay overnight. Who is the next person to ask? Hey, Judas, prepare the budget. Oh, we need some, some uh, food for our journey. We're going to travel for three days uh, tomorrow. We need some supplies. Judas, make sure we have it. Judas is very close to him. So you will, you will, you will think, now, the moment somebody is getting close to you, now you have a decision to make. To take advantage of that or to make your relationship lasting. The Bible says, uh, if we draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to us. That is one passage. But prior to that passage, the Bible says, when thou sayest, seek ye my face, thy face do I seek, O Lord. Meaning the spirit of the Lord works in your heart. Okay? Works in all of our hearts. That's why all of us here feels a drawing in our spirits. I mean, I, I don't care if you are consistent in coming to church or not. Okay? There is a drawing in our hearts to be close to God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. How you respond to it is different. When Mary got saved, the way she responded, her faith grew into deeper devotion. Your faith can grow like that. From faith to deeper devotion. Judas took his relationship with Jesus for granted. He started being close physically, but his heart started going backwards. While front and center of Jesus' life and teachings. So what happened to Judas? Now, at this particular junction, Judas embodies selfishness. She was, he, was, he was taking, he bought a piece of land for himself uh, from, from the money bag. You can just imagine those who were healed giving gold and silver to Jesus Christ. So he was able to, uh, to do S -s selfish. He expressed his feelings in cheap sarcasm. When, when, when I read that, that was a cheap shot. Huh? Have, has anybody ever uh, given you a cheap shot? Yeah? Uh, I remember we have somebody here who left the church and he wrote my board a letter. Uh, and, and said, I, I know that there's something wrong with pastors. I don't know where it is, but you go find out. That was a, that was a cheap shot. Because Anna and I have helped their family so much. And, and that happens when you begin to be very casual in your relationship with people. You're no longer pressing closer when you can easily put down somebody even for no reason. Well, sometimes the reason is just to elevate yourself. Now Judas is saying, hey, I care about the poor. That's for 300 dinara. And he said that, not whispering to somebody, at the hearing of everybody. He doesn't care now if Jesus can hear him. Have you noticed disrespect is like that? Yeah. If your kids respect you so much, when they begin to rebel, they will not say it at your hearing. The moment, the moment they start saying that at your hearing, that's escalation of hostility. You see, that's escalation of hostility. There were things that my, my parents, uh, that I disagree with, with my parents. I will never uh, curse them. I will never 
speak ill of them on public. But the moment I lose self-control, sometimes you throw fits, you throw attitude in public. The moment your children started throwing fits at you. I'm not talking about kids, okay? Because kids doesn't know what they're doing. I'm talking about teenagers, grown-ups, and they're showing their disagreement with you in public, shaming you in public. That's a different level. That's a Judas level. Okay? That's a Judas level. Now, I, I, always, I always believe this. Uh, somebody was talking to me about parents not, not here. And I said, hey, listen, your parents are old. What, what do you mean, Pastor Jose? Give them their face. I said, they're ready to die. You're still young. What are you, what are you doing? Well, my, my parents are wrong. I know they're wrong. Who cares if they're wrong? Give them, give them their face. I don't get this when children humiliate their parents. Who in the world do you think you are? They're dying. I mean, Jesus, Terry, in a few years, I'll be gone. Can you imagine how, how I would feel if my kids will humiliate me? I'm ready. I'm, I'm about to die, so to speak. Kids are young. They have, they have plenty of time to live. But not the parents. Not the parents. That's just the natural course of things. So give them their face. Now, Jesus has been saying, I'm dying and here you are, one week before you die. 300 denarii is worth. Jesus, he has been telling you he's going to die. You know? If you know somebody is about to die, what do you do? What do you want? I'll tolerate this, you're going to die anyways. What do you want? What do you want? And if you don't die in time, akala ko patay na, tinulungan pa naman kita, sayang. Diba? But when somebody is about to die, you give them what they want. This guy have lost, have totally lost respect for Jesus. He's now throwing cheap sarcasm. Listen, we have to be very careful with our words. Of course, jestings are not allowed in the scriptures. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm getting old now. I'm telling you, old people have a different kinds of emotion. It's an old emotion. You know? <laughs> it's worn out. <laughs> you, you don't say, you don't say, matanda na sa na yan. No. No. If, have, you, have you worked with, well, this is America. In, in the Philippines, if our clothes got a tear, you patch it up, right? Have you ever worked with, with old clothes that you can no longer patch up? You, you hold it tenderly, you know. Because you have no other underwear, that's it, you know. The only thing that holds is the garter, so <laughs> you, just, you just hold it <laughs> carefully, yeah. Because it's, old people are like that. They don't go, get used to it. But the difficulties of life had actually make them more fragile. Oh, they're old. No, no, believe me, they are more fragile, they're old. That's why you have to be more careful with their emotions, you have to take care of them even better. But what I'm seeing are youngsters behaving like devils, not, not considerate of the uh, feelings and what the old people are going through. Now, Jesus is about to die. He don't do that. You know, my, sometimes my, my, my siblings in the Philippines will tell me, oh, Nana is a tatampo. You are here in the Philippines now and you go on missions right away. And you don't even see her first. I always see her last because I don't go here. To, I, tell, I, tell my, I tell my mother, Nay, you know, I, I did not come here to see you. I tell her that, with a smile. But even if my, my mother throw fits, I will never get back at her. She is old. I mean, she, she could no longer even walk for 30 minutes now. She is old. Yeah. So one time my sister was telling me, Kuya, Nana is whining, this and that. I said, Ah, oh, don't pay attention to it. I came to see her. She was really whining. I did not even pay attention. Yeah. If she wants to yell at me, she can do that. Who cares? I'm young. You know. 
I don't want to give her any more heartache. Yeah. So she was whining. Ah, Fed, don't pay attention to that. She's old. Yeah. Are you here? <laughs> Merry Christmas. Okay. And then he constituted himself a critic. Can you imagine this guy? <laughs> you're, you're critiquing a perfect man, the second Adam. He dare present himself, he's actually presenting himself as better than Jesus here. He lacks tact. That was amazing when he blurted this out loud. Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Number one, Mary could not sell it for 300 denarii. Why? Because he bought it. It doesn't belong to her. She bought it for 300 denarii just for this. He has become, uh, his, his behavior became so presumptuous towards Jesus that it's actually a deflection of what is already happening in his heart. You, know, you have to be very careful with people who tell you, I'm just concerned about you. Okay. People who are concerned about you demonstrate concern. They don't say it. Yeah. My wife is the most concerned about me. She doesn't come to me every day. I'm just concerned about you. No, she, she doesn't do that. Sometimes she will find me wearing a tie that she doesn't like. She will not say, I'm just concerned about you. Change the tie. No, she will, she will grab the tie. And she will tell me, if you wear that, I will hang you with it. You know? Wear this other one. That's, that's concern. <laughs> she expresses it differently, you know. But here he has become, let me ask you about your relationship. Have you, have you become presumptuous with your relationships? Yeah. I, I think we, we take for granted relationships that we become presumptuous like Judas. Yeah. Now remember there are certain things you can change. You know, like I'm, I'm talking about, about uh, parents here. Parents are, parents are old, you know. And you really cannot change them. My, my, my kids sometimes will complain about, about my wife. I'm sure when they are with my wife, they complain about me. Uh, that's, that's how it is. So, so they'll complain about my, my wife, and, and they'll say, this and that. And I said, do you, th do you think your mama will change? She said, no, exactly. All people don't change. Yeah. Yeah. You're very quiet now, huh? <laughs> they, just, they just don't. Leave them alone. You know, leave them alone. Uh, <laughs> well, I cannot tolerate that. You don't have to tolerate it. You, you really don't. Just be nice. Be yourself. Yeah. If they are talking, they are complaining, let them talk. Don't answer. Your problem is you answer back. And you become disrespectful. Now remember I I told, what I told you earlier. They are already very fragile. All people are fragile. I'm not going to look at anybody. And, you know. <laughs> now, he was, he was also one disciple. Look at this. Mary is remembered for her loyalty. Judas is remembered for being a traitor. Judas also demonstrates the language of a thief. What's the language of a thief? Hypocrisy or uh, duplicity, two phase. Number two, deception. And number three, mal intent. You know. Have you ever uh, talked to thieves? I'm sure you, all of us have. Especially the salespeople, you know. Oh, this will really look good on you. They know it will look bad on you. You know, this will really look good. Sometimes we'll be shopping, and, and uh, there will be a salesperson who will say, Oh, this will really look good on you. And I'll say, Anpala niya sa kin tanga. Ang sama sama ng itchura, it'll look good on me. I'm, I'm really concerned about you. This will really look good on you. No, you will really look bad. But their intention is only to make money. Malintent. You know? 
And, and this is where, where, where we have to do. A thief is like that. A thief is like that. So, so I, I remember when, when, uh, when I was telling my father when he was alive, I said, uh, because he's got, he's, got, he's got money in cash. One time our apartment was being burned, was getting burned, and my father told my, my family, leave the, leave the apartment. What about, what about the stove? You know, what about the refrigerator? If there's fire, you're going to carry the refrigerator. You know? <laughs> Sometimes people just don't think. Uh, what about the, the, the chairs? The chairs have been repaired multiple times. You know? And I remember my father said, my mother was telling me the story, just leave everything alone. The important thing is all of us survive. We leave. I was doing ministry during that time. And my father says, everybody out of the apartment. And he just took one polo. It turned out the polo has over 200,000 pesos there. You know? uh, he doesn't bank. So uh, I, I, told, I told my father, you need to put it in the bank or the thief will come and steal it. And I said to him, you need to put all, all our lands in the province in your name. Because if, if, if you die, I said, my mother will have nothing. Oh, my father was furious. Oh, you just want my lands. You just want my money. That's why you want to put it in the bank. And I, I look at my father. You know, I did not scream at him. I said, okay, let's, let's make a deal. I said, I will not get, if you, if you move all of these lands in your name, I said, I will not get any of it as my inheritance. I said, I will not put my, I will not have you put my name on your will. I will have nothing. I said, because I'm just concerned about my mother when you die. Well, he didn't listen to me. He died. None of the properties went to my mother. And my mother laments that. Yeah. Finally, he, he decided he will put the money in the bank. And said, said, put everything in your name. Yeah. I said, no, I will not put everything in my name. And I, I refused. Yeah. And so my father once doesn't want to go to, it ended up becoming me and my mother. Now, when we were about to, to buy a house, you know, you buy a house, cash there. My, my father trusted me already, so he said, Jose, I don't want to deal with any legalities, with any taxation, with anything. He said, I want you to put the house in your name. I look at my father and says, I told you, Tata, if you do the right thing, nothing will be in my name. I did not put it in my name. I said, I will get nothing for myself. Why? I am not a thief. All I want is uh, for my parents to uh, be in the right place. Yeah. That's why when they sold the house after my father died, my siblings wants to part the money. It's just over a million, but, but they want to part the money. And I get upset. I said, if I go back to the Philippines and my mother has no house, I'm going to go after you guys. Yeah. So they got her house. And they said, well, Jose, you have to make a decision. I said, why are you calling me? Over? You have to make a decision because... We, we want, your name will be in the title. I said, no. I said, do not put my name in the title. Why? Because I want to be able to give the right advice and, and, uh, and uh, give the wise decision for suggestion. What? I'm not a thief. Why will I, why will I put my parents raise me up already? That's enough. Okay, I can, I can fend for myself. And so that's, that's how I did it. You see, but but uh, Judas, my goodness, this guy, he wants to keep stealing. He wants to keep, his, his intentions are different. Now, this is where, where we, we now begin to look at uh, the heart of Judas and the heart of Mary. That's a decision of faith. You, you and I, we have to make a decision what kind of heart we are going to have. I, I told you when, when uh, Elizabeth was dying, she wanted all her money. She wanted to give everything to Anne. And my wife was getting nervous. I said, no, don't touch it. I said, what do you mean? I said, she's got a daughter. I said, what will happen to the daughter? A pastor's wife took all her money. I said, what about her salvation? I said, that is nothing compared to her salvation. Let her remember that that should have been an opportunity for her to lose all the money, but you gave it to her. But she was... She was uh, she was giving her her jewelries. Yeah. So when she died, I mean, if you are the caretaker, what will you do with the jewelries? 
all, right, all the jewels were in the box. When she came, the first thing that she took was uh, the box of jewelry, everything intact. Why? Because we're concerned about her soul. You see? Because we were not thieves. Are you listening? You need, you need to be able to, to have a, uh, a right and honorable uh, disposition in life. Acting on the basis of your faith. Now, that study, in contrast, demonstrates once again the development of faith and unbelief among those who follow Jesus. Listen, we all get born again. Either your faith is developing or your unbelief is growing. After you get born again. You know. Have you heard of the statement, they fell in love and then they fell out of love? When you, fell in love, when you fall in love, you should keep falling in love. We even have a song, I keep falling in love with Jesus over and over and over and over again. Okay? Well, some people, the moment they fall in love, they started falling out of love. So it's like some, some kids also. When they are young, they love their parents. The moment they get old, they fall out of love until they don't even, they're no longer concerned about their parents. But the Bible talks to us, uh, Paul taught Timothy, that we should have debt of gratitude uh, to our parents because they raise us up, especially those who raise up in the, in the fear of the Lord. Look at this. The, the, either your faith is growing or you're falling down into unbelief. Okay? The development of faith or the development of unbelief. Mary's past. Some people say she was a prostitute. We know she was demon-possessed. Whether she was a true prostitute or not, I do not know. Okay? But say she was that. Listen. Mary's past, whatever it is, now that she has come to faith, was replaced by fire of devotion, fueled by her growing faith. If your faith is growing, your devotion to Jesus will continue. Look, I've been serving the Lord now for over 40 years. I still want to come to church. I still want to read my Bible. I still want to explore the things of God. One of the things that made me feel very sorry about COVID-19, I cannot go to missions because Jesus loves missions. Can't go to missions. First time, the, the moment this door and missions opens, I'll, 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 I'm, I'm going. You know, that's why I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm, I'm uh, following news like that. I'm telling you that, that thing happens. I'll try to avoid or evade all kinds of government scrutiny. I'll I'll get vaccinated with with a uh, antidote for for COVID. Just so that if I can show the certificate I have been uh, vaccinated, I can be allowed in right away. Why is that? Because Jesus loves missions. You know? and, and your heart goes up for, for, for that. One of the things that was, I'm very sorry is, uh, I'm asking God, uh, will I still be able to build a university? Because I'm on the list of things that I, I want to do before Jesus takes me home. My wife was reminding me, we have, we have done uh, almost everything. Uh, it, of course, it should be continuing, except building a university. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm telling the Lord, Will I be able to fulfill it? You know, and I'm telling the Lord, if I'm able to fulfill it, may, shall, shall, shall I be allowed to pass on that kind of passion to somebody so that they can, they can build the university? Because, because David had a passion to build a temple. He died without building it, but he financed the building of it. You know? So I was, I, was, I was asking God for that. Your devotion, your, your growing faith should show deeper devotion to Jesus Christ. You know, and look at, look at this. Whatever her past is, that is a past. If your faith is growing, you should get over yourself. You know, some people keep talking about their past, they were this, they were that. The moment you get born again, that's done. You know, that's, that's, that's just done. Sometimes my wife will tell me when we're talking, how many girlfriends did you have? Anne, just be quiet, okay? We're married now. Can you imagine married couples? How many girlfriends did you? How many boys? You, you're going to torture yourselves. But people like torturing themselves. Share it. You know, you're already married. Stop talking about those things. The moment you get, you get born again, the same thing. Forget the past. God already forgot it. You know? Forget it. Move on. Grow in your faith. In the words of Paul Roberts, do not let your past 
paralyze you. But be determined to do your best for your future. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and we can, all, we can, we can also add, add here her own redemption by Jesus, it evoked from Mary such a thanksgiving she could not conceal. conceal. Gratitude cannot be hidden. She presented this very expensive perfume or ointment as a logical expression of gratitude. Because now her faith blossomed into devotion. Okay? He who was forgiven much will be more grateful. Okay? However, Judas was, was different. His salvation becomes a platform for her selfishness to, to grow. Well, I'm born again now. I'm following Jesus. I, I abandoned what I was doing. I'm following him now for three years. I deserve this. I'm going to buy me a piece of land. I deserve this. You know, I deserve this. I deserve this is a language of modern man. Everyone, oh, you deserve this, you deserve that. Well, a servant of Christ don't deserve anything. You know, remember a servant coming from, from the farm? He came home and his master said, I'm hungry now. Cook my, ta- cook, cook my food. And after I cook the leftover, you can eat. Will that servant complain? No, Jesus said. He will just say, I'm just doing my part as a servant. I'm just grateful. Because servants in those days is a luxury for others, especially during Roman captivities. Why? Because famine is ongoing. If you can serve, remember the parable of the prodigal son? Oh, he's saying, the servants in my father's house can eat better than this. He was thinking it will be a privilege if I can just be a servant. That's the attitude that we should have. Can you imagine we're on our way to hell? To serve God like Mary, like Martha and Mary. To serve God is a privilege. But the moment you become like Jesus, well, he's dying anyways, or well, he's not going to do an armed revolution. I'll take, I'll take what I can have. The moment that is your attitude, then you are no longer grateful. I, I think the, the American workforce, by and large, became like that, especially the immigrant uh, American, uh, American workforce. Remember when we were back home? Oh, there's no job. If I can only get a job. No, but the moment they, they get a job here, they forgot to be grateful. Now evading taxation. Now wanting to get more. You, you lose gratitude. The same thing is what we express towards Jesus. Judas was from the zealot group. He carries a scary or sicari type of sword. That's why he's called Judas Iscariot. Perhaps because Jesus refused royal claims of overthrowing Rome. The zealots came to Jesus because they have expectations that he's the Messiah. A Messiah will deliver them from tyranny and so will deliver them from Rome. But Jesus refused armed revolution. It disappointed uh, Judas. All of us here, when uh, we come to Jesus or when we come to church, we have expectations. Sadly, most of the expectations are wrong. Okay? Most, like, like, I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I've heard this. It disgusted me. Because somebody approached me already this before. Uh, somebody died here before, and uh, not, not even not even a member of the church. And then the uh, I think the niece or somebody, one one leader of the church says, "Oh, you, we'll 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 do uh, an, we'll do a watch here in the church." One of the leaders of the church, a volunteer, we'll do a watch here in the church. And, uh, well, these are two people that I'm combining into one story. And, and the church will probably help, you know. Somebody actually came to me and says, uh, Pastor said, uh, I'm asking for reimbursement. I said, I said, reimbursement of what? I already gave the donation to the dead person. I said, that person is not even a member of the church. And, and somebody took the initiative, actually presumptuous, to give donation on behalf of Pliant's Heart, and I was being asked to reimburse. You have no right to spend the money of the church. That's not your money. Become presumptuous. Yeah. Well, he looks, she looks good. 
in front of uh, her friends. And then somebody says, well, it's going to be interned in the church. I said, the person is not even a member. Well, your, your leader said you want. I said, I didn't say that. I said, I'm asking if there's a help that the church can do. Well, the way they called me is, you wanted. I said, no, I didn't say that. What happened? People become presumptuous. Yeah. People become presumptuous. We have to be very careful with that. Because if that is the expectation, that becomes wrong. Because when we come to church, we come to love God. We come to serve God. You know? We come to give our lives to Jesus. We come to worship Him, and we come to tell Him, what would you have me do? That's, that's the attitude of a question. That's, that's why in, 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 uh, in all the churches that, that I have worked, I never negotiate on my salary. Because I, I have always believed that I am serving God, and, and I'm very grateful to the Lord that I am getting paid for what I love doing the most. I mean, some of you, you, you work for a company, you, don't, you hate the company, you know. You don't like the company, but you work for the company because of the money. Well, in, in the ministry, you don't work for, for the ministry for the money. You, you are glad that you can serve and then get something uh, material out of it. Then you are more grateful and you are most grateful. But people forget that. Judas forget that. He has his own agenda. He thinks his agenda is to be followed. Remember when we were buying this next building? Uh, we have the central property building. A, a person who attends the church came to me and says, Pastor Sip, you will buy that uh, corner property there, which is smaller than what we have. If you buy that corner property, I will give you the building fund. I just smile. That's your agenda. If you want what you want to happen, then you're going to support it. That's not, how, that's not how it works. When we get born again, we come to the house. Of, it's, just like, it's just like this, okay? Your, your sister is in America. And uh, your sister says, well, me and your brother-in-law is blessed now. We can take you in, okay? And then you tell your, your sister, I will only go there to America, accept your offer, if, number one, you give me a car. Number two, you wake up at 6 a.m. and feed me breakfast. No, you don't. You are just grateful. You come and say, well, thank you. I remember the first house that I lived in, in, uh, in Virginia Beach, Nanay Evelyn and Tatay uh, De Castro. So two of us were, were entertained in the house. And so we were given a chore. Uh, one day a week, including the kids, one day a week I will do the dishes. Okay? And we were, we were uh, okay, Jose, this is your day. You will do the dishes on this day. You will do the dish on this day. So everybody, okay. You know what I did? I did the dishes every day. The moment, <laughs> the moment uh, we're done eating, I'll go to the sink and do the dishes. Everybody was happy. But one day, the Anna Evelyn came to me and said, Jose, oh, no, not, not, not her, the, the eldest uh, son, uh, Ruel, came to me and said, hey, Jose, why are you doing this every day? One day, I'm supposed to be in charge. The other is, why are you doing this? I said, well, this is the least I can do for your family. I said, God, I don't know you. <laughs> you took me in. I ate your food. I sleep in your house. This is the least I can do. I do all the dishes. Every weekend, I mow the lawn. Yeah. When their washer and dryer breaks down, I volunteer. I take their laundry. And I do the laundry. I don't ask for money. I pay the laundry, the coins. And I'll be pressing my clothes. I look at the clothes of, of uh, the, the sun. It's not pressed. I press it without being asked. I said, why are you doing this? You're not supposed to do this. I said, this is the least I can do. Yeah, that's the least I can do. And I'll go on missions, right? And uh, I, uh, I'll go on, yeah, I'll go on itinerary preaching during the two weeks quarter break. I'll be able to raise some money. The moment I come back, I separate my tithes. I, uh, I pay whatever I, obligation I have in school, and I will tell the family, let's go to the commissary, because they're in the U.S. Navy, and we will shop. I'll fill the refrigerator with goods. Now, my money is very much budgeted. I'll fill the That's the least I can do. 
I eat the food every day. I sleep on their bed every day. That's the least I can do. Why? I am grateful. Are you listening? Hey, listen. Let's be, let's be honest here. Some of you were not here when, when we bought our first building and we buy this building. Be grateful we have a building. Okay? Now, don't go get some food and hide it in some closet until the rats get it. Show gratitude. Help clean up. Because some of us paid for it, you know. When we began, be grateful. No, sir. Uh, who's this? Uh, Brother Willie and Brother Junior decided they put a key on that uh, thing. Well, because he just, we, we just jet, uh, we just do hydro jet, and they found a bunch of toilet papers and brown paper that I keep saying don't put in. And the week after it was fixed, it clogged, and they found a bunch of it again. Why? People are not grateful. You're not paying for it, guys. You may not even be paying your tithes, okay? The least you can do is be grateful. Because this, I'm sure, tithers will keep this house clean. Because their money is on it. Are you here? We need to show some gratitude. That's why I'm going back to, to, to parents. Me, I'm just, I'm just grateful for my parents. And I'm, I'm grateful for my, for my mother that she's still alive. She, she just got sick and now... She recovered. You know, she, she got sick. She was not asking for anything. And my wife and I sent her some money, and, and they said, no, no, we're, we're not asking. I said, you're not asking. I'm sending. Oh, I, I know it's hard in America right now. I said, I know. Nobody's asking. Because me and my wife, uh, we're just grateful. If you're grateful, you don't have to be asked. It's getting hard now. Good, I have five more minutes, you know. Mary gave everything to Jesus and gave everything to overflowing about where, where, uh, wherever this gospel, in another gospel account, wherever this gospel shall be preached, this story will be told. Can you imagine? Mary! What do you think about Mary? Ah, oh, the first evangelist. What do you think about Mary? The perfume. Huh? What do you think about Mary? Weeping. Worshipping. Let's talk about Judas. Napasama nga pati yung isang Judas studios eh. Ang bait-bait nung isa. Sino Judas siya? No? Judas. Scariote. You know, in the Philippines, it's even a curse word now. Judas ka talaga. Ang ganda-ganda ng pangalan eh. Judas means praise. When you curse somebody, Judas ka talaga. Yeah. That's what we remember Judas now. You see what happened? Because very short-sighted. Very short-sighted. Judas refused to join the program of Jesus. He went the opposite direction. The gospel presented Judas as a restless, dissatisfied, and insincere follower of Jesus. In verse 4, Judas was mentioned as one who is about to betray him. The engine of betrayal began, and he failed to stop it. He failed to stop it. Remember, the engine of denial began also on Peter. The engine of abandoning Jesus began on the other disciples. All of them stopped it. Judas did not. How did they stop it? They repented. Judas was remorseful. What is remorse? He was sorry he was caught. Huh? I found people like that. They were just sorry because they were caught. They are never repentant. But a person who will put a stop on a downhill path of unbelief, they repent. Yeah, we make mistakes. We repent. We don't feel sorry that we were caught. Next time I'll get better in, in concealing this. So you become a better thief. You, know? you become better in rebellion. 
you become better in cheating. You become better in stealing. You become better in all of this. You are not repentant. All of them, understand all of them, Judas and the other 11 disciples. Judas, the engine of betrayal. Peter, the engine of denial. The rest, abandoning Jesus. But all of them, except Judas, put a stop. Stop, this is wrong. Jesus did us good. Jesus sacrificed for us. He came back to life. He did everything that he said would happen, happened. I'm putting a stop to this. Listen, when we begin to find ourselves tracking the path of unbelief, you better step on the brakes. And the way you step on the brakes is repentance. Yeah, repentance. And when you repent, you turn around. Don't be like Judas. Judas was just remorseful. He was sorry. He was caught. And by the way, the, the, the reason why people like that get away uh, with it is because we don't practice discernment. Yeah. We don't practice discernment. Uh, when somebody have a uh, pouty face, you know, and, and a sorry face, we look at that and say, oh, it's repentant. No, 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 repentance is turning around. That's what you have to look at. Be very discerning in the way we look at the people and the way we look at the heart of the people. Because either your faith is growing after you met Jesus, or you are going downhill on the path of unbelief. One of the two. Okay, one of the two. Choose what path you will take. Amen? Amen. It's all done. Praise God.